June 2023 was a month full of contradictions, plot twists, and tragedies. This podcast episode would not suffice in tackling all of them, especially our main topic, but I might as well be doing this because with what happened that month, we can only ask ourselves, have we forgotten to be human after all? Hi, I'm Ian Rinyon, an independent alternative media practitioner, among other things, and welcome to another episode of the Intrepid Podcast. In this episode, we run down the very big things that happened in the world during the month of June 2023. I've already shared some initial thoughts about this on my brood banter on the 1st of July, so if you haven't watched it yet, I would link it in the YouTube description or in the Spotify show notes. And before we begin, please make sure to check out all of my socials. The links to them are also in the YouTube description and Spotify show notes. And just in case that you hear some banging, uh, don't worry about that. It's just some uh, repairs that are uh, happening inside Intrepid HQ. Uh, You don't have to worry about that. It just means that uh, this place is... uh, coming to life, and uh, sometimes uh, broken things happen, and yeah, uh, we need to repair it. So, let's get this show going, and we begin with the tragic loss of the Ocean Gate submersible called the Titan. Now, aboard the Titan was Ocean Gate CEO Stockton Rush who acted as the sub's pilot, as well as four other people, including a Pakistani father and son tandem. It's been on the news for at least one week straight, and some say it shouldn't be. Or it was better for the media coverage to focus on the migrant boats from Africa crossing into Europe. Now, from where I see it, It seems there is an inverse sense of empathy based on someone's net worth. The poorer and more desperate you are, you are valued and your death deserves to be mourned. But if you're filthy rich, you deserve to be three times below the ninth circle of Dante's hell. Now, there's even some memes and sloganeering incidents on social media because of the Titan tragedy such as quote-unquote eat the rich and the general celebration of the deaths of these five people just because they're rich. Now, to be completely honest, I don't get why people are like that. But here's my hopefully nuanced take take on the Titan tragedy. Now, before writing, consolidating, or aggregating the latest news, news stories and the countless perspectives about them became a job for me for uh, a couple of years now, it has, been, it has long been my lifestyle as a media scholar and practitioner to monitor them. The destruction of Ocean Gate's submersible Titan has been the story I've been personally following for most of that week. Not a single day on that week has passed without me and my colleagues and um, several others in the industry writing an article about it. Now... Uh, my job aside, but my job aside, and I don't want to divulge more of that, I, it has just been hard to comprehend both the chronology of how five individuals lost their lives because Rush apparently turned a blind eye and a deaf ear to the concerns about the quality of the sub's construction and the rationale behind it in the first place. And on the other hand, the multifaceted reactions, perspectives, scientific opinions, and even memes. There were all there were also memes 
that surfaced in this uh, uh, because of this incident and it varies uh, when, uh, from where you see it but yeah now while it is easy to blame Rush for convincing at least three people to pay a quarter of a million dollars for each for a seat on that sub and they're not even seated properly with uh with seats they just have they just have to uh cross their legs just to sit uh as well as the passengers for being suckers for an adventure into the deep to see the titanic even for a moment it has been hard for the rest of us to not only to look at the whole story objectively but also and perhaps most importantly, to just be human and show at least a pinch of decency in dealing with the story in the first place. In short, we are all more than our net worth. And then we have the Filipino media plot twists at the end of June, at least here in Metro Manila, because, yeah, there has been a rigodon, and the mid-year media rigodon was real. So, to give you a little bit of context, and this is where I would wing this uh, part of the podcast. We all know that ABS-CBN was shut down in 2020. And that means uh, everything has to be diversified and dispersed to uh, other media institutions. And dispersed, they did. So, uh, as a result, we have ABS-CBN shows on multiple channels, on multiple platforms. And some of the thing, some of the platforms that they were not affected with, are still continuing and uh, taking their stride. That is, it also applies with uh, with the presenters themselves. So, uh, some of them or or the practi- or the professionals themselves. So some of them were retained, others were uh, sadly let go, and there are others who. Uh, willingly uh, left so that they can continue their uh, their shows or their uh, projects or their passions elsewhere without without any grudges to ABS-CBN because they uh, uh, all of them were just um, all of ju- all of them were just affected by the by the uh, non-renewal of their franchise so yeah that's uh, that's what happened now, uh, because of the Capamilia shutdown, uh, there was a there was an observed uh, degradation on the quality as well as in the uh, mindset regarding broadcast media in the Philippines, and it took three years to uh, to stabilize it. Uh, and despite the shakeups that happened in the past three years, uh, the media industry uh, became apparently stable until May thirty first, twenty twenty three. Because deep down, there were actually some uh, tensions that simmered below the surface, and most of which was between. Tito, Tito Soto, Vic Soto, and Joey De Leon, Tito Vic and Joey, TVJ, and the new management of Tape Incorporated, which is the production house that once produced, or at least uh, by substance, produced Eat Bulaga. So what happened is that there were conflicts between, or there were conflicts regarding how uh regarding how the show must be uh must be formatted and there's an ideological divide so to speak because TVJ were used to live um live noontime shows but uh the Halos Hos family who uh, who runs Tape Inc. wanted it to be more of a tape as live uh, program, and because of this ideological 
uh, difference, TVJ and uh, all of the all of the original presenters of Eat Bulaga left Tape Inc. as well as some of the production staff that was involved, and managed to. Uh, transfer their prospects elsewhere. So, to give you some context, it's been more than 40 years since Eat Bulaga started. It started in RPN9, then it uh, transferred to ABS-CBN, and for the longest time, it has it has been on GMA. And now, there's there there are, there seems to be a split between the, pre- the, the producers and the showrunners. Of that show because the producers remained on GMA but the showrunners are now on TV5. Yes, TVJ is now on TV5. And because of that, Showtime, which was once on TV5, had to uh, transfer elsewhere. And irony of ironies, they had to transfer to GMA. That's just... um, I mean, as someone who has been uh, alive when it comes uh, uh, when during the time that the the media rivalry between uh, Kapamilya and Kapuso Networks uh, were rampant during the ni- 1990s and early 2000s, it just is weird. But you know, uh, behind that or beyond that uh, apparent rivalry, everyone is um, everyone is friends with everyone in the media industry. It's a small world. So, uh, whoever, uh, whoever, uh, is, a uh, good, whoever is, uh, on top when it comes to ratings, it's the Filipino people that would benefit. It's not the whole, uh, it's not the media industry itself. Um, I don't want to say it's monopolistic competition, but it's more of a friendly rivalry because, Deep down, everyone, everyone is just um, doing their jobs. So that's just uh, that's just my take. And besides, having some kind of insider um, knowledge back in college, and perhaps even now that I have um, I have friends and colleagues and classmates who are involved in the media in the media industry, everything's good in the hood. It's just that. Uh, as uh, as someone who is uh lodged in the public in the public eye and are seeing things in the public's perspective, even though I am an I am a media practitioner and a media scholar back then. Yeah. Uh, it seems weird, but yeah, that's just uh, how uh the media industry goes. So, yeah, there, there's a lot of noontime shows now. So we're back to, uh, we're back to the, uh, back to zero actually because TVJ is now on TV Five, and because of that, Showtime had to, uh, transfer to GMA, and uh, basically they are competing with whatever's left of Eat Bulaga, and uh, I can, I call it. I call that uh, program as Rump Bulaga. And uh, Rump Bulaga is floundering in the ratings because uh, wh- after TVJ left. Because it's... Uh, <laughs> um, even though the producers have the money, the showrunners have the influence. So that's just how uh, things go. And Basically, the showrunners are the life of any show. That's why they're called showrunners after all. It speaks for itself. The word speaks for itself. So, uh, that's... uh, And ironically, Tape Inc. and uh, Rump Bulaga is, uh, is now in a position... Where student canteen was back when they started in RPN. So, uh, student canteen was basically uh, 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 the the only other 
um, noontime show GMA had, and it was and it was during the 1970s and 80s, and then uh, eventually it will uh, uh replaced that during the late 80s or early 90s when they transferred from ABS-CBN to GMA. So yeah, uh, it's just ironic that. Uh, they are now in the position where Student Canteen was back in 1979. So perhaps it's the beginning of the end unless uh, something uh, happened between the, uh, between Tape Inc. and DVJ and, uh, and all the other sh- shenanigans that uh, is too long and too uh, deep for us to dive in this episode. But Whatever that that is, the clear winners of the ratings wars is not the networks themselves, as I said, but the Filipino people. As long as they are uh, entertained, that's good. As long as they're they're entertained, uh, uh, my fellows in the media industry are. Um, are basically doing their jobs well. So, I congratulate them for that. Now, it's not just on TV noontime shows that there has been a uh, media rigodon. Radio stations have also been uh, uh, having its own plot twists, uh, if, I, if, I call it, um, if I call it that. First off, we all know that because of the Kapamilya shutdown, even the raid, e- even ABS-CBN's radio stations were shut down. That includes uh, the former DZMM in the 630 kHz frequency in the AM band. Uh, just recently, ABS-CBN had a deal, a block time agreement between Prime Media, owned by uh, Martin Romualdez, and uh, and a, and it's a fifty one forty nine uh, agreement or a fifty one forty nine deal, wherein uh, Prime Media is the majority stakeholder, but ABS CBN provides the content, so it's still break even, but uh, it's a slight majority for Prime Media fifty one forty nine fifty one to forty nine. That's uh, how it goes. And when I say it's a plot twist, it's because Alvin El Chico and Doris Begornia were the last presenters that were heard on the 630 kHz frequency back in 2020. Three years later, uh, they also closed down uh, the extended Teleradio format before they opened the new DWPM uh, station on the 630 kHz on June 30th, 2023. So, they turned from late night presenters to breakfast presenters overnight, literally. (laughs) So, they ended their Teleradio stint as late night presenters. They had uh, some kind of a a few hours of sleep and then after that, at 6 a.m. during the first ever uh, sign-on of DWPM, Alvin El Chico and Doris Bigornia had their revenge. They were the first uh, voices to be heard on the 630 kHz in 2023. Now, there are also uh, future stations that are uh, being uh tested at this point if i'm not mistaken bomboradio is uh doing its fm uh is having its fm uh or er, am rather am uh station i am not sure which frequency but they are having an am station in the future because uh as we all know they uh they sandwich their news uh programs in between uh their um their music um their music block times in 
their uh, 102.7 uh, frequency or 102.7 frequency in the FM band. And uh, when it comes to uh, when it comes to switchovers, 105.1 turned from top 40 uh, from top 40 format to being uh, a news and um, news and music uh, format because Mareco Broadcasting Network has uh, permanently shut down Q Radio uh, on all its stations in the Philippines. Brigada News FM uh, has took over Mareco's Manila and Cebu stations uh, on 105.1 in Manila and I think it's 90.7 in Cebu. And prior to June 30th, this this hap- the the shutdown and switch over was um uh, happened on June 30th and the midnight of July 1. So that transition. Now, prior to June 30th, Brigada News FM was operating on the on the 104.7 uh frequency in Batangas City. Upon the launch of the Manila station, the Batangas station or the Batangas the Batangas City station would uh, shift its, its focus uh, to local news. And since Mareco shut, has shut down Q Radio in the airwaves for good, 105.1 transitioned from Q, Q Radio to Brigada News FM by midnight of July 1. And as of this episode, Brigada's broadcast operation is now in full swing. I was also informed that uh, the third Radio Pilipinas station on the AM band, there are three actually, uh, 738, 918, and I'm not sure 12 something in uh, uh, further in the further in the frequency band uh, is uh, relegated as an emergency um, as an emergency uh, uh, station or an emergency station up uh, emergency update station because uh, as we all know the Philippines is a disaster prone country so I guess that's also a win. What else? Yeah, I think that's all. Oh yeah. Back to ABS-CBN, there's also uh rumors that Prime Media would also reactivate the 101.9 uh Manila station and other uh, and other former MOR FM stations across the Philippines uh to its own format. So uh, as we say in Tagalog, abangan ng susunod na kabanata. Basically, it just means uh, more videos soon or uh, to be continued. So, yeah, that's uh, that's basically it. Now, regarding the quote-unquote Love the Philippines copy by the Department of Tourism, I would let media scholars squabble about it in their classrooms over the interterm and when they return to class by August. So, I would leave it at that. Now, on to another topic that is very close to my heart, and that is uh, everything about the military. Now, I'm not a diehard geopolitics and defense enthusiast like the people behind Max Defense and other Filipinos in the defense and security community, but as someone who had the chance to serve our country any win to make our country safe from threats both foreign and domestic is uh, is a win for the Filipino people. So in short, I'll take whatever makes us sleep a little more soundly at night, even if I consider and myself a pen sentinel at night for a living. There are reports that the Department of National Defense is going ahead with the acquisition of Saab's much-marketed JAS-39 Gripen into the Philippine Air Force instead of the Lockheed Martin F-16 Viper. Now, according to Max Defense, uh, the acquisition of the multi-role fighter, or strictly speaking swing role, just like how um, the Swedes and Saab are marketing the Gripen, may go ahead and contract will likely be, and a contract rather, will likely be signed within it, within the year. Now, it added, and I quote, we already received several confirmations from different Philippine Air Force, Department of National Defense, and industry, and industry sources confirming the selection and that 
the funding was al- has already been prepared by the Department of Budget and Management awaiting a formal release of a Special Allotment Release Order or SARO. What this means for us outsiders and defense enthusiasts is that we can now have the capability of dispersing some aircraft that are easy to maintain, refuel, rearm, and service by an, ex- by an experienced crew chief and a few novice mechanics all the more take off and land on any road if necessary in 15 minutes or less, 20 minutes tops. So, uh, to make it simpler or to make the explanation simpler, the Gripen is basically uh, capable of being dispersed to other air bases or to, uh, to contingency air bases, which is basically... Uh, which is basically uh, roads that are wide enough and long enough for the Gripen to land. And if I remember correctly, it only needs less than less than a kilometer long runway that is around 20 meters wide. So uh, I think the I think the minimum is 800 meters long and 16 meters wide. But uh, I guess it's safe to say that it should be a kilometer long and 20 meters wide so that it has some kind of allowance. But either way, uh, our roads are, are... Some of our wide roads that are flat and uh, straight can be used as runways for the Gripen. We have expressways and highways that, are, that can be uh, used just in case, God forbid, just in case air bases have been destroyed and that's basically the the doctrine that the Gripen has been uh has been dealing with or has been uh practicing because the Gripen was uh uh was initially designed uh as a counter to Soviet threats you have to remember Sweden was a little bit near the Soviet Union back then, and it's still near Russia because of uh, because of Kaliningrad. But uh, that's a lo- another topic for another day. But personally, I call the Gripen the flat pack fighter since it's it's a Swedish plane. And you know what's more I- ironically or iconically rather Swedish than that, or even PewDiePie? Yes. PewDiePie is Swedish, even though his wife is Italian, they're in Japan, and he's gonna be a father. Congratulations, uh, Pewds. Congratulations, Felix. Uh, be a good, be a good husband, be a good father. But the question remains: What's more iconically Swedish than than the Gripen and PewDiePie? And you guessed it, it's IKEA. The fame, it's fame, uh, which is famous for its flat pack furniture. Thus, I call the Gripen the flat pack fighter. But to give my two cents here, our country's defense authorities should push for a both end perspective instead of an either or between the F 16 and the Jazz 39. The Gripen, particularly its uh, C or its Charlie Delta model, can be purchased. First, for its affordability and the eagerness or aggressiveness of Saab's pitch based on our national situation. And then, since Lockheed Martin is bluffing at this point, we can have the Viper later uh, in, uh, in later uh, iterations of uh, the acquisition program as either an upgrade or an augmentation fleet or force multiplier specifically for our FA-50 FA um, jets. Now, at this point, other than the Swedes, the Brazilian, Hungarian, Czech, and most recently, Thai air forces each have a fleet of Gripens. Whether Saab is giving us new planes for the, for the mentioned air force from the, or the mentioned air forces would transfer their Gripens as they upgrade to fifth generate, generation fighters like the F-35, being in the early customers club would be a good position for the Philippines compared to the long line of customers buying F-16s. 
And guess who's also in line for the F-16? That's right, Ukraine. Volodymyr Zelensky's government is at a fever pitch in westernizing their defense capabilities and transitioning Soviet-era technology to their system, uh, out of their systems. Rather, Ukrainians have the same dilemma over choosing the Viper or the Gripen. Ultimately, Saab had to decline Ukraine's bid due to the lack of units compared to the vast F-16 fleet Lockheed Martin has. And to add insult to injury, or perhaps in a twist of irony, it's the Danes who would train Ukrainian pilots on the F-16. If you're Swedish, you might, uh, you might ask yourself, what the hell? You know, it's, um, <laughs> yeah, uh, it's just ironic that, uh, it's the Danes who would train Ukrainian pilots on the F-16. Although, um, Sweden also trains Ukrainian pilots for, for the Gripen, but, uh, it seems that Ukraine is, uh, pushing more on the F-16 than with the Gripen, and it's because, as I said, uh, Saab doesn't have that much Gripens to uh to give to Ukraine. So uh, I guess that's uh that's just how I see it, and that's just how a lot of military analysts uh see it. Now, while naysayers think the money spent in national defense would be better spent elsewhere to improve the welfare of Filipinos, methinks the paramount welfare we must all consider is our national sovereignty. And in this day and age, when other nations assert their dominance over others under the guise of hegemony, it is necessary for nations like us to assert our sovereignty because any other welfare than sovereignty, no matter how enticing, is useless if we are not free. And we end this episode with that, with that, with what many could think as the most surreal June ever. Because over the, the because it's uh yeah, we all know what that is. In twenty sixteen, a self proclaimed feminist named Cassie J created a documentary film called The Red Pill to understand why there is a men's rights movement when apparently it's the women who are being oppressed. Producing that film changed her life forever. Her cinematographer and production assistant for that docu is now her husband, despite the fact that he is four years younger than her. And as someone who uh, is in a relationship with someone older than me, not bad for a young king. Now, the Red Pill exposed the need for good men to be treated with respect just as men treat women with admiration and protection. The docu was critically underrated because... During that time, the men's rights movement was the subject of ridicule. But because of this docu, and let's be honest, because of all the brouhaha between Johnny Depp and Amber Heard, discussions regarding men getting the shorter stick in everything has become a rising trend, especially with the increase of women knowingly or unknowingly quote-unquote hitting the wall and men going their own way. It is only when Depp sued Heard to court for her proven domestic abuse incidents did the film and, quite frankly, the concept that men can also be victims of domestic violence and disenfranchisement make a lot of sense. While women still struggle to be heard in in terms of a lot of things, they are being accommodated by society thanks to the work of first- and second-wave feminists. But at the same time, these accommodations women uh, to women are oftentimes at the expense of men, but they manage, manage to get on with, with it so far. But having said that, however, do the third and fourth wave feminists really want equality or do they want supremacy? To give a perspective, in our modern times, women are now at positions of power more than ever in the history of humanity and perhaps rightfully so. Given this much-empowered state, it is unfortunate that the radicals of the feminist movement aim to control the narrative to their favor instead of merely 
aiming for equality or to be proper equity. This gives the radical feminists and their adherents the license to use social systems to their advantage by quote-unquote getting rid of biological males by any means necessary. In doing so, this allows effeminate men and discouraged men to be uh, uh, to add here, to add uh, from the script, to become trans women. Ironically, thanks to fourth, third and fourth wave feminism rather, biologically male athletes who seem to be underperforming in their categories see sex change as a way for them to achieve a podium finish in whatever sport they compete in, sometimes at the expense of biological females. Take Leah Thomas in swimming and Austin Killips in cycling, for example. These kinds of athletes are pushing biological female athlete, athletes like Riley Gaines and Hannah Arnsman, respectively, out of their own sports at such very young ages. And let's, uh, let's not go uh, further. Here in the Philippines, and as someone who has been cycling for at least a year now, there's this... Um, Smurfing incident, and uh, it's still going on to be honest. That uh, a transgender cyclist, which is uh, who is uh, around 18 years old, is a biological male but competes with the women. And other than criticism, and, uh, and aside from formal criticism from folks like me, uh. People on social media have also been um, up in arms because uh, him being male or biological male is an absolute advantage. It's just it's just Austin Killips all over again. So uh, that's uh, that's just uh, it. And uh, uh, as of this recording, uh, that person attempted to uh, register in the women's category in Phil Cycling's uh, event in Tagaytay. I am not sure if it went through or it already went through, but uh, on later lists, that person's name is no longer there, so I'm, I don't know if there's, uh, if there's something that happened behind the scenes, but at the very least, uh, the social media team of Phil Cycling uh, has been uh, reading the comment section when they first saw or when they first posted the list of um, competitors in that um, in that uh, competition. So uh, I guess credit where credit is due. But then again, having these kind of incidents so much for fighting the patriarchy when it is men living and thinking like women, damaging the movement. Now, having said that, and as we slide the slippery slope, pop culture has allocated the month of June, which in previous times has been the month of weddings and in the Philippine context, the, the month of independence, as the month of rainbow pride. And please be advised that I would use the, uh, the term rainbow here as an umbrella term for the LGBT plus community because it is the most nuanced term to use. I'm not here to shit on anything and absolutely not on this topic lest I commit ca character unaliving if you know what I mean. But what started as a niche movement within the Stonewall Inn in New York has overflowed into all aspects of our society worldwide. But at what cost? Just like feminism, the rainbow movement came in waves, perhaps parallel to their feminist counterparts in terms of when it happened and what their agendas are. First and second wave rainbow activists, and we call the first wave gay pioneers and, and the second wave marriage cohabita or cohabitation equality, have uh, clearly made their mark about society's acceptance of homosexuals, or to be much more accurate, non-heterosexuals, as fellow human beings, and how it could combat 
discrimination. However, third and fourth waves of rainbow activists, which we may call the drag queens and the turf hunters respectively, are more of a stab-on-the-back kind of people to their feminist counterparts than a friendly rival or reliable ally. They only support radical feminism if trans women are included and if it favors their own narrative to boot. And what do you mean turf? Tango, Echo, Romeo, Foxtrot. They would also dismiss uh, J.K. Rowling, yes, the author of the Harry Potter, Harry Potter series, as trans-exclusionary radical feminists or TERFs. That's the meaning of TERF. Tango, Echo, Romeo, Foxtrot. Trans-exclusionary radical feminists. So that's that. So yeah. Here's where the feminists and the trans activists go physical. Literally. But it's not even a contest. Trans women are initially built with male strength and that is a scientific fact. Having said that, we transition to what happened with Aura Brigella. It's a can of fucking worms right now. And given, given the fact that physical and perhaps sexual harassment or assault was involved, especially with uh, the male involved in this incident. And because of the CCTV uh, footage in that bar, it's just becoming... It, the, the can of worms is just getting bigger. But while investigations involving Aura and several men in a Makati club brawl are continuing, it only just solidifies the fact that uh, uh, some of these people are actually pulling their own movements down. And let's not forget about the detransitioners. They are those who have tried to transition from one gender to another no matter how absurd the concept is, but have decided not to push through later on. Some are lucky enough to retain the physical, su- retain the physical stuff they had at birth, some of them, some um, capabilities, while there are others who are deeply regretting, regretting their choices and have reached the physical point of no return. Male detransitioners are regretting the fact that they could no longer be able to produce the seeds for creating children, while trans men have been literally crying when they realize how it is to be a man and how it absolutely sucked. While I am tempted to say, you should have listened to Nora Vincent, or Matt Walsh, or Cassie J, or even Ollie fucking London, the reasonable part of me tells me, you are right, but it's not kind. Because I also have to mind their own mental health as well. Well, men are, when men are needed the most, rather, they are already gone. Those of us who remained are heavily outnumbered in these culture wars. Indeed, there is some truth to the saying that no one loves the warrior until the enemy is at the gate. Nevertheless, the warriors of sensibility and nuance, both male and female in whatever gender that uh, they are, have not yet fallen. But until then, the question remains unanswered for those who who refuse to answer it. What is a woman? And another important lesson here is about the right application of knowledge about things involving physicality and sexuality. Knowledge is power, but power corrupts. And what's the, the, the next sentence? Yes, absolute power corrupts absolutely. But you know, not all hope is lost. Thanks to Jaya, yes, our own uh, singer who, uh, uh, who has migrated to the United States. And she is the one who, uh, who sang Wala, Wala Na Bang Pag-ibig, I think. Yeah. Uh, it's been a meme as well here. We Filipinos were introduced to the organization called Gays Against Groomers. It is a breakaway group of rainbow, pri- uh, rainbow people rather, who came to their senses and realized they have already reached the ultimate goal of acceptance. Now, 
while I personally have heard about these sensible rainbow folks long before Jaya ever mentioned it on Twitter, it is just great many of us are already having this shift towards hating the sin but loving the sinner attitude towards non-heteros who just wanted to live their bloody lives without getting without being too garish about what about about it rather and imposing it on others especially children now full disclosure i had gender dysphoria back in my preteen and teenage years and perhaps that's why i deeply understand in the long run the struggles some of my gay and lesbian contacts friends and loved ones face some rainbow contacts of uh, of mine seem to be of the opinion that they are still at risk and they still need to fight for what they perceive as their rights to them i say i wish you a very good life as long as it does not come as asinine to those who just wanted to live a good life you do you other rainbow contacts of mine are actually christians who wish to live chaste lives and carry their same-sex attractions as a cross they are able and willing to bear for the love of god who loved them for who they are to them i say keep it up for as the apostle saint paul wrote to the romans know ye not that all we who are baptized in christ jesus are baptized in death for we are buried buried together with him by baptism into death that as christ is risen from the dead by the glory of the father so we may also walk in newness of life for if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death we shall also be we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection knowing this that our old man is crucified with him and that the body of sin may be destroyed to the end that we may serve sin no longer for he that is dead is justified from sin and being someone who adheres to the belief of the divine in collaboration with human endeavors i invite you to pray the collect to the sacred heart of jesus the heart that bled out of love for man i also invite you to pray for this nation we call home or at least think deeply about her benefit as we just ended the 125th anniversary of our nation's declaration of independence O God, win the heart of thy son wounded by our sins. Dost mercifully dost vouchsafe bestow upon us the boundless treasures of thy mercy. Grant we beseech thee that we who now render him the service of our devotion and piety may also fulfill our duty of worthy satisfaction. Through the same Jesus Christ, thy son our Lord, who liveth and reigneth with thee in the unity of the holy ghost ever one god world without end amen almighty god who hast given us these good islands the pearl of the orient seas for our heritage we humbly beseech thee that we may always prove ourselves a people mindful of thy favor and glad to do thy will bless our islands with honorable industry sound learning your manners save us from violence discord and confusion from pride and arrogance and from every evil way defend our liberties and fashion into one united people the multitudes brought hither out of many kindreds and tongues and do with the spirit of wisdom those to whom in thy name we entrust the authority of government that there may be justice and peace at home and that through obedience to thy law we may all we may show forth thy praise among the nations of the earth in the time of prosperity fill our hearts with thankfulness and in the day of trouble 
suffer not our trust in thee to fail. Through Jesus Christ, thy Son, our Lord, who liveth and reigneth with thee in the unity of the Holy Ghost, ever one God, world without end. Amen. On that note, I end today's podcast. I would like to thank you all for listening. Recording of this episode would be available on YouTube and Spotify with further plans to expand to other platforms, so please make sure to check out for that. All of the materials I have referenced for this episode would be listed in the recording's description. And if you think there are things I might not have included in this recording, or if you want to have your say about the matter, please feel free to leave them in the comments below if applicable. Also, before you go, please make sure to like this video and share this video around if you're on YouTube. Subscribe as well to my channel, Intrepid Ian Rinyon, and ring the notif notification bell by selecting all so you, so you wouldn't miss out with whatever future content I may create. Please follow me along as well on Spotify for more podcast episodes so that uh, you, have an, you have an option to, uh, to listen and not watch basically a podcast episode uh, that doesn't have any uh, faces or video in it. So at least you have that option. Anyway, with all that said, this is Intrepid Ian Rinyon reminding you to at all times be the salt of the earth and the light of the world. Until then, look alive, stay alive, be kind to yourself and to each other. And as always, thank you for tuning in. From here in Intrepid HQ, see you next time for another talk here on Intrepid Podcast. See you now.